Good afternoon and good morning to some of you, I believe. Welcome back to the fifth of the sixth week and in our installment, fifth installment out of our six week series talking about compensation planning. Welcome back. Glad you guys are here with us today. So this presentation today is brought to you by the STAR Center, which is Solutions, Training, and Assistance for Recruitment and Retention. The STAR Center is a project of the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, or ACU, and we are funded by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare as a national cooperative agreement. So with that national cooperative agreement, we're actually one of 20 organizations meant to bring you resources on a variety of different topics affecting the health center landscape. And as you may or may not know, we are funded at the STAR Center to provide you tools and resources in regards to workforce. So out of the 20 NCAs that are out there, there are only two of us that provide expertise on workforce, and the other one is CHC Inc. out of in Connecticut, they provide expertise on team-based care and pipeline development, and we develop resources around recruitment and retention. If you hadn't had a chance to go to our website yet, please do so. Our website is chcworkforce.org, and you can find all of the free, yes, free, tools and resources there if you hadn't had a chance to go and take a look at that. And if you haven't had a chance to get there recently, please go back. We are constantly developing new tools and new resources there. So take a look and see what might be new since the last time you were there. I'm Suzanne Spear. I'm the Director of Workforce Development here at ACU, and we have a whole team of folks at the STAR Center. I am joined today by Mariah Blake on this call. Mariah Blake is our pro uh, program project manager, program manager. I can't talk today. Sorry, guys. And she keeps everything going in the right direction. Allison Abe-Sekra, who, who you may have heard of, she is our VP of Training and Programs. She is not on this call today, but she is a vital part of our team, and so we always like to list all the members of our team on our calls when we have them. Just a few webinar housekeeping items to, for you guys to take note of. We are recording today. As we do with all of our webinars, we are recording this webinar, which will eventually be go up later this week on our website, so you can access the recording through our website, and it will also be emailed to you. As someone who is registered for this series, you'll also get a recording in your email box as well. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. You can put them in the questions box, and we will be monitoring those throughout, answering them if there is a break, and then, but any that we don't get to during the webinar itself, we will answer during the end there. So sit back, relax, and get to get ready to have some fun as it talks relates to compensation, talking about current practice and future trends. Today we are excited to have Alexia Eslam, who is the senior consultant at John Snow Inc., or otherwise known as JSI. You might have heard of them. They do a lot in the healthcare space, and so we are excited to have Alexia with us today. So without further ado, I will hand it over to her. Take it away, Alexia. Thank you so much, Suzanne. It's my pleasure to be with you today uh, to discuss provider compensation. So as Suzanne said, my name is Alexia Eslin, and I am a senior consultant at JSI. Um, I've been at JSI for 12 years, and I have extensive experience working with providers, staff, and executive leadership at community health centers and clinics uh, throughout the U.S. to achieve what we call the quintuple aim, uh, better health, better patient experience, lower costs, joy in practice, and equity. Uh, prior to JSI, I was a business operations manager at Kaiser Permanente, um, looking at both operations and revenue cycle. And prior to that, I actually was a manager of market strategy at an organization called Colorado Access, which is a health plan for uh, safety net providers in Colorado. Um, 
So as I go through the presentation today, um, please, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send those questions via the, the chat or the questions function. And I will try to address them as I'm going through the slides. If by any chance I don't get to any of them, I will definitely address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. I also love to hear about your own experiences because I know everyone has um, a lot of experiences that they bring to the table. So when we do the Q&A um, section, I would really love um, for you to share some of the experiences that you've had. So today I'm going to focus on sharing some of the current research on provider compensation. Um, we are going to talk about, um, we're going to go through assessing uh, your provider compensation package and what that might look like and thinking about your own organizations um, and providers. Uh, then we're going to look at some opportunities within that assessment um, and start making a plan. Um, I'm also going to share a couple case studies of um, some early adopters um, in making some innovation in provider compensation models. So provider compensation models are directed towards making change in the practice. These changes may be to improve productivity, quality measures, or become more competitive in provider recruitment. Uh, whatever your motive has um, spawned the, more, the move towards compensation modification is meant to make improvements in the practice. So as such, the compensation model is part of a practice's quality improvement efforts. And I think that sometimes um, we don't associate them both together, and it truly is part of that quality improvement effort. Um, so provider compensation formulas put into place without consideration for each step involved in quality improvement typically do not fare well. Um, so things to look at within quality improvement is ensuring that you have strong leadership, you have provider buy-in, um, looking at the policies created in advance and what do those look like, and testing and assessing um, what that model might look like. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the model um, for improvement from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. This was developed by the Associates in Process Improvement. Uh, many of us know it as the PDSA cycle. And this can be applied to developing a provider compensation model. Um, so it's a way of testing a model out before you actually implement it. And there's a lot of research that um, supports doing that to make sure that there's more buy-in from providers, that it actually works for your practice, and that it has a, and that it's sustainable in the long term. Um, so when looking at the model for improvement, the first step is uh, planning. And so within planning, you have forming the team. So who's part of that team? Uh, potentially administrative leadership and providers. Then setting your aims. So what are your major goals and anticipated benefits that you're trying to get from having the compensation model? Um, look at your policies and make sure that your policies clearly define what that will look like. Um, and then look, so for example, who is eligible, compensation model distribution methods. Um, one thing to mention here is when we talk about provider compensation, um, we typically think of administrative leadership and providers as the only team members. Um, we do a lot of work at JSI um, helping practices to transform to team-based care models and patient clinical home models. And one of the things that we've seen that has been really successful is actually including all the team members within that compensation model especially if you're looking at incentivizing on quality um, outcomes. You want to look at who is part of the team, who's working with the provider, and is contributing to those indicators. So as I go through the presentation today, um, keep that in mind. Think of uh, not only the providers, but also who are the team members that are working closely with that provider that can have an impact on that compensation, and how are they being compensated, and are they being incentivized as well to support um, those measures. So after you do the planning, you decide who's part of the team, you set your aims, 
then you want to actually move into studying. And this is the testing phase. So um, a recommendation is just to conduct the shadow comp compensation period. So basically a test period. So you're testing the system without any penalties. Uh, you are measuring and reporting and seeing how um, each of the changes are, are affecting. Um, you have this constant loop where you're providing feedback back to providers. Um, I think this is really important that you're reporting what you're seeing and that you're getting feedback from them. Um, and then you're making modifications as needed throughout this testing period. Um, it's nice to have this testing period because then it allows you to make these modifications before actually implementing um, the final package. Um, which is the, the final step, which is the act where you're actually implementing the changes. So if you have a, an existing compensation package right now and you're looking at changing it, um, you could test these changes. Or if you don't have one, then you could look at um, what one would look like. And we're going to be talking later on about assessing and what those different models look like. So this is just giving you an idea of this, how you can use the PDSA model. Um, to come up with a, plan, a, more, a compensation model that really works for you. Um, as you probably already know, that last bullet point on there, studying the impact of the changes is really important. So making sure that you're measuring um, the impact as, as you're going along is, is really uh, important. Okay, so let's move into the compensation model. So there are four main categories of physician compensation models in the literature for employed physicians or those in private practice. There can be any combination of these models, such as base salary in withhold or bonus situations set as the percentage of past revenues. Bonuses and withhold return can be based on various types of indicators comprising productivity and or quality measures. The final distribution under each of these models is based on a formula that is devised by the practice to divide revenues up as individual income. And so the formula that you use can be very simple, um, for example, as an equal division of practice surplus amongst all providers, or it can be pretty complex with many factors that, include, that are included in the formula. Um, often formulas become more complex due to efforts to be fair. And um, what we've typically seen is that the simpler the formula, the easier it is to manage and to get buy-in from the providers and understand it, um, but ensuring that fairness um, throughout. So that's something that you would have to look at individually. Um, before we jump into talking about each of these models, um, I would love to get a sense from the audience on which, if you are doing compensation models currently, which ones you're doing. Uh, we don't have a poll, but I would love it if you could raise your hand. Um, so who, who is doing currently just straight salary as a compensation method? Okay, I see a few hands raised. Great, I see about five. Okay, if you can lower your hand now, thank you. And let's look at production-based salary. Let's do production-based salary. Okay, about five hands as well. Great, and I'll go into more detail on what that means. Um, okay, salary reduced by withhold. Okay, and I don't see any hands raised there. And that a withhold is not as common as a bonus, so um, I'm not surprised there. Um, and then salary plus bonus, if you could raise your hand. Okay, I see three hands raised for that. Great, okay, well, thank you so much for participating and giving me a sense of uh, where you're at. Um, so the straight salary model is um, or was once pretty common in academic centers, government practice settings, and in some health maintenance organizations, HMOs. 
Um, and it does remain prevalent in some of these settings nowadays, but we were seeing a gradual change of structures that combine more of a base salary with a bonus base uh, on the physician's productivity, performance or quality metrics, or, uh, or actually increasingly both. Um, the straight salary model is typically good for newer physicians who are still learning uh, the practice, but long-term uh, financial incentives um, without the financial incentive, there is a risk of discourage, discouraging um, quality improvement and entrepreneurship. So that's something to look out for, which is the straight salary model. For the production-based salary, let me go back. Okay, and I'm not sure if you all know what that means, so I'm gonna define it for you. So this model um, has many variations actually, and it actually can be pretty complicated. Essentially, if physicians are paid a percentage of either buildings or collections, or they're paid based on the resource-based relative value scale units assigned to procedures or patient visit types. Um, and then the overhead costs of the practice, both fixed and variable, are allocated among the physicians. Um, so there's pluses and minuses of each of the components you can look at under the production-based salaries. Um, so the first one here is gross charges or billing. So that's one production measure you can look at. Um, the nice thing with looking at that is that you can give immediate feedback to the providers. And there's no penalty for payer mix differences, which is good. Um, but the danger here is that you might be paying more than net revenues. So as we all know, many times we, our charges are um, considerably higher than the actual revenues. If you're paying on net revenues or collections, obviously you're addressing um, that issue. Um, it does recognize the payer mix differences. Um, the issue with net revenue or collections typically is that you're not getting that information until quite a bit later, and so you're not giving real-time feedback um, from when the providers are actually seeing the, the patient. A couple different, a couple additional components you can look at um, for production is patient visits or encounters. Um, so this is the direct tie to productivity. It doesn't account for acuity differences in visit types, so it looks at all pretty much the same. Um, it could be negative if more care is provided telephonically or electronically. So as we're moving to providing care outside of the actual physical uh, practice, um, this would not um, account for that. Um, and with value-based payment, there is definitely a movement towards doing more um, care outside of the actual practice. And if you're looking at just patient visits or encounters, it could negatively impact practice for capitated patients. Um, looking at relative value units, this definitely accounts for acuity, which is positive. Um, and it also looks at the physician work RVU um, that recognizes professional components. So depending on, on their skills and experience, it will pay more um, depending on that. So that's production-based. Um, then jumping into the third model, which is the salary reduced by withhold. There is um, withhold and bonuses or compensation mechanisms designed to put part of a physician's salary at risk. Um, this part of the salary is paid only if certain performance measures are met. A withhold or financial penalty is in place when a physician is offered a maximum salary with part of that salary being held back. And then payment of the withhold or part of the withhold would then be paid based on the performance measure um, or it could be held back if that's not met. A bonus or incentive payment, which is more typical, is in place when a physician is offered a minimum base salary, since so the max offering more of a minimum base salary with the chance to earn additional um, payment for performance. And the bonus, obviously, as with the withhold, would be paid based on current performance. And when I say performance, I mean either productivity or, or quality. So that would be, or, or both, 
depending on the measures that you select. Um, so we've definitely seen more of uh, more people doing bonuses or more practices doing bonuses versus withholds, just because the withholds do feel a little bit like a penalty. Um, so our last model is uh, pay for performance. Is basically a quality incentive. Um, so the, the research is a little less clear on the value of rewarding performance based on quality indicators, and, and this is simply just because it's, it's newer. There is some evidence that compensation tied to quality can be effective in improving quality. Um, there's a study that Kaiser uh, Permanente did um, in which they looked at removing financial incentives for clinical quality indicators across 35 of their facilities. And there was a measurable decrease in performance of about 3% per year on average for their diabetic retinopathy uh, measure and about 1.6% per year for cervical cancer screening. Um, so there's some evidence, again, this is uh, a newer way of, of paying, and so um, there's not too much um, in the evidence right now. Um, sharing the rewards for improvement across a group of physicians uh, can dilute the value of the reward and makes the connection between service and reward more distant. Um, so many times it's important to look at, um, you can see this quote here from Clan to P, which says uh, we shouldn't incent what we can't change and can't measure what we can't um, capture. So we need to make sure that whatever we decide to measure truly is um, in the physician's control. Um, physicians can be unclear about which quality indicators are being rewarded, so it's important to make sure that there is that tie. Um, these last couple bullet points on too narrow and too broad, um, it, it is really important when you're looking at what um, quality measures you're going to look at that there's enough that can be impacted, but you don't want to include too many or too, too small. Um, so along this line, the study showed that there is no spillover effect for other quality indicators if they're not incentivized. Um, and then it shows that if it's too broad, then they don't feel, physicians don't feel that they can have an impact and they become confused. Um, so things to think about when you're looking at uh, quality incentives. So the Hague Consulting Group conducted um, a survey of physicians across the country um, and this data is a little older data, but we've definitely been seeing this um, movement of, of including more of these measures and incentive plans. Um, really what I wanted to highlight in this um, slide is types of measures that you could think about including in an incentive plan. Um, and if you notice here, there's measures that are specific to individual physicians and others that are specific to the physician group. Um, research shows that it's good to include both. Um, as I mentioned earlier, having that individual physician responsibility um, creates buy-in and then the physician feels that they can have a direct impact over the measure. But then you also want to make sure to be building the team and camaraderie within your group. And so having measures that look at um, the whole, uh, the group as a whole um, helps towards that. Okay, so this um, chart right here looks at incentive components, advantages and disadvantages given some of the research. So um, the first one looks at incentivizing by productivity. And so you would have like a salary and bonus or a salary and withhold and the incentive um, to get that bonus or to gain back the withhold would be on productivity. And this looks at 50 to 100% of that bonus or withhold being tied to productivity. Um, so advantages is that it can increase the bottom line, the financial performance. Um, and some of the disadvantages, as you can see here, is that providers might be resistant on that. 
um, and that there is some evidence and actually it could be counter, it, it could be detrimental to motivation so that it would actually counter what you're trying to, to do. Um, then to make this successful, some of the key success factors are to pick something that's already being measured, and you'll see this in the other um, options as well, that instead of trying to create something new, it's important to, to look at things that you're already measuring. Uh, the, apologies. Um, I was just checking qu quickly if there were any questions. Um, and then another key success factor for productivity is um, making sure that the message is that more productive is a form of increasing quality, uh, because otherwise you could get into a problem where you're just um, seeing more patients just for the incentive when it's really not contributing towards quality. Um, so looking at quality as, as far as a component, um, and in this case, 30 to 50 percent of that incentive um, would be tied to quality. Uh, providers do feel this is an important aspect of medicine, and so there is a motivation to work on quality. There is some evidence that taking incentive away can reduce quality, as I mentioned in the study from Kaiser. Um, there's some reports that physicians do not pay attention to metrics, and so this uh, would be hard if, if, if this occurs. But I think that if you focus on creating a culture of quality within your organization, um, that can definitely shift. So I think this is more traditionally, but I've seen with all the practices I've worked with, I've seen a big shift towards focusing on quality. Um, again, key success factors for this also includes the pick something that's already been measured. Um, measurement and monitoring itself is the biggest step towards increasing quality, so making sure that you have accurate data that you're looking at and that you're measuring it often, having someone that is responsible for doing that um, is very important, and how you um, track it, like with a scorecard or something, is very important too, that it's easily, easily trackable and shareable with uh, providers and team, team members. And there's a mention here about using outside standards. So when you're setting your goals, um, you can look at um, standards for like local or regional standards in, in, um, that are applicable that you can compare to. Looking at uh, moving on to patient satisfaction, um, this looks at 10 to 30% of that incentive being tied to patient satisfaction. This is very important to patients. And so that's who we ultimately want to um, make an impact um, on. So very important to, to include a measure that addresses um, the patient's view. Um, it can definitely, some of the disadvantages shown by the literature is that it can be influenced by specialty. Um, so some specialties have a harder time to have patient satisfaction or higher satisfaction scores than others. Um, and again, here use existing uh, measure. The, the last one is the citizenship concept, and this is really uh, rewarding for um, having providers be active um, in, in the community, um, making a, kind of a bigger difference in, in the larger um, community. Um, this rewards that community involvement, development of programs, engages passions of providers, um, and doing things that they like um, um, that are maybe above and beyond what they typically do. Um, the disadvantage can be seen, seen as kind of a uh, gimmick or not really directly tied to, to the work that they're doing. Um, and if one of the key success factors to make this, this incentive work is to reward, reward the work that is above and beyond expectation of basic job. Um, that's critical. Okay, so these are looking at those incentive um, options, some of the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, and just kind of along those lines as well for the pay for performance and incentives, um, here this slide shows some of the um, specific um, 
features that could be improved for through pay for performance programs. Um, so for the first one, frequent small payments may be more psychologically motivating than one large sum. Um, we, we see this a lot. Um, paying more frequently allows the reward time period to more closely match the work done to earn it and have a greater influence on behavior, even if the payments are smaller. Research has also shown that using graduated target thresholds is more effective than an absolute threshold. So for example, a bonus given when 75% of targeted women receive mammograms may seem an unattainable compared to a smaller bonus received at 25% with, with increasingly higher bonuses at a higher threshold level. Um, incentive payments seem more meaningful when not lumped in with salary so that you, they really know this is separate, this is um, the incentive. Um, often in-kind incentives such as trips, dinners out can feel more valuable than cash incentives. So that's something to think about. Um, what does your, what do your providers uh, really value? Um, a quick way to get a sense of this could be conducting a survey with your providers and, and different team members to see what, um, what are some other things that they would be interested in. And then annual performance reviews can also be used as um, non-monetary incentives. And, and I know traditionally there's the annual performance reviews, but one thing to consider is should there be more uh, reviews more often, especially as you're looking at quality indicators, um, having meetings more often with your providers to discuss their quality measures and how they're doing and some of the barriers or challenges they might be encountering is, is really important. And so um, you might have an official annual performance review, but you can have more frequent um, meetings throughout the year. Okay, so before I move to assessments, um, let me just do a quick check to see if there's any questions. So if you have any questions, um, there's a question function here. Okay, so I see a couple questions. Um, what is salary reduced by withhold? Um, I think this might be an older question, um, but basically, um, this is probably when I asked you to raise your hand. Um, so as, as we talked about, the withhold is basically you're paying um, a top salary, the maximum you can pay the provider, and then you're withholding a percentage of that in order to incentivize the provider to um, achieve certain uh, productivity or quality um, measures. Is there any other more recent data than 2013? Um, you know, for that specific study, uh, that was the most recent data, um, but there are some other um, articles that discuss um, that, like different quality um, indicators that could be used. Um, and I actually, at the end of the slide deck, I do have a number of sources listed. Um, and you can, and many of those include it. And I can also send some additional ones if needed. Um, there's a question here from Katie. What is the percentage representing for each? Um, and I'm not sure what question that's referring to. Um, so if you don't mind, um, Katie, um, if you still have that question, if you could send me uh, the question again and just uh, um, annotate what you're referring to. And um, there's a comment here, um, and, I, and I, I definitely can see um, how this can be done, that it, it says that it's um, kind of um, discouraging that we have to incentivize people to do their work. Um, and I know that there's definitely practices that don't use monetary incentives because they feel like it is a responsibility to, to do the work and so they use other types of incentives. And again, as I was talking about incentivizing the whole team versus just the provider, 
can help create that um, teamwork and camaraderie within the practice and not make it just um, about the individual providers. Um, so things to think about. Um, thank you, Katie. I see you. We stand here on the breakdown for percentage on the incentives a few slides back. Um, okay. Let me just go back. Oh, I think it was just percentages here. Okay. And so the question is, Okay, so what is this percentage representing? So basically this represents the percentage of the incentive of the like bonus payment or withhold that is associated to that specific um, option. So for example, if anywhere from 50% to 100% of their bonus is associated to productivity, this these, the literature has shown that these are some of the advantages and disadvantages, and for quality of 30 to 50 percent. Um, so this is not saying that that should be the percentage range you use. It just says that within the literature that we reviewed, these were the percentages that they looked at. Um, so you can use a mix of these. For example, you could have some measures that look at productivity. You could have some measures that look at quality. Um, patient satisfaction and citizenship. So you could include all four of these within your um, incentive program. You could just include one, you could include two. Um, so that is depending on your uh, practices, organizations, um, goals and aims that you've set um, for doing this work. So right at the beginning when we talked about setting those aims and goals, it's very important to be clear on what you want your compensation program to to achieve, why are you doing it? Um, and then looking at what incentive measures to, to include. Okay, well, I'm gonna move along and then I'll come back um, after the next few slides and um, address any other questions that come in. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about doing a assessment um, on where you're at and where you wanna be with your compensation. Um, system or program. So the first thing when you're designing or trying to change a current compensation program is to look at um, all parts of the current compensation package that you have. So what does the salary look like? Um, are you providing any bonuses? What does that include? Um, and then making sure that you also look at the benefits that you offer um, on top of that salary and bonus. Once you've looked at that, then compare um, to local and regional benchmarks. Um, this is important, making sure that you're competitive compared to some of the um, other providers um, or plans or practices in, in your area. Um, so you wanna make sure you're looking at provider type when you're looking at benchmarks and looking again at all that full compensation um, pieces. And then see how you stack up. And I think, how do you stack up with each individual provider, but also how do you stack up as a whole, as a practice? Once you look at that, um, some other things to look at is um, if you're gonna be doing um, incentive, pay for performance, um, type um, incentives, then you wanna look at where you're at currently. What does your productivity look like, your panel size, clinical measures, patient satisfaction, um, and other components per provider, as well as if you're gonna be doing some group measures, looking at those as well. Um, the administrative performance by provider, this is looking at are your providers, do they have admin time and what are they doing within that admin time? So potentially, are they doing quality improvement work? Are they doing some mentorship? Are they part participating in any um, CMEs or meetings? And um, what does that look like per provider? And that's one um, measure that you can also include within your incentive. Um, package. Um, 
and then the actual clinical hours compared to the, the contract, if you have that specified. So once you've looked at both of those, so once you've looked at what it currently looks like, compared it to the benchmarks, and then look at where they are with the different incentive measures, um, then you want to look at where are your opportunities for improvement. So pay equity, how are you paying um, all your providers and comparing to the, the benchmarks? Um, what improvements do you want to do given your current data? Um, do you want to, the hours work, productivity, quality, team participation, all these things are things for you to look at um, and see if there's room for improvement and if that's um, the focus that you want to give. Uh, notes here is about this budget constraint. So very important to look at what does your budget look like, what are your resources, and obviously within that, um, coming up with um, an incentive package that uh, makes sense. Uh, here it reiterates what I mentioned about having provider meetings. Um, and in, in this one, it's opportunity to talk about like the current measures, but also do they have any kind of reservation with the compensation package that you're thinking about or the incentive measures that you're looking at, um, at including. Um, so making sure to um, get feedback from all the providers so, um, that, so that you get their buy-in. And then use data collected in assessments to begin compensation planning. Um, very, very important, the, the data, as I mentioned earlier, making sure it's valid, making sure you're tracking it often and sharing it. So these are some of the opportunities um, given those, those the assessment. Um, I wanna share two case studies um, before we go to Q&A, just to give you an example of what some of like pay for performance early adopters have done. Um, so Minneapolis-based Fairview Health Services is one of these early movers to pay for performance. In April 2011, the health system dropped relative value units as a payment model for primary care providers and established a compensation framework that ties 40% of physicians' payment to quality metrics and 10% to patient satisfaction. So as I mentioned earlier, there's different things you can choose. They chose the, um, the quality and patient satisfaction. That's what was important to them. Um, productivity still determines a percentage of the physician's com compensation, but productivity is defined by acuity adjusted panel size and clinical activities rather than RVU. Um, so that's the model that um, Fairview Health Services did. Then similarly in uh, Pro Health Care in Wisconsin, basis 10% of employed physicians' compensation to quality metrics. Here leaders from these two organizations share tips on how to transition from an RVU and a productivity focused payment model to a pay for performance system. So these are kind of like the lessons learned that the leaders from these two organizations have, uh, have shared. Um, so share the data to gain buy-in to a new compensation model and incentivize physicians effectively. Healthcare leaders need to share data with the physicians and ensure that the data is accurate, as I mentioned a few times. Um, then tie the compensation to desired behavior. Uh, Fairview, for example, first piloted a new care delivery model focused on population health and later designed a new compensation plan to align with the delivery model. Um, their, their president of their medical group, Brent Aplin, said it didn't make sense to ask care teams to reorient their work around quality experience and total cost of care, yet only reimburse based on RBU production. So as they were moving towards a new way of delivering care, they wanted to make sure that their compensation model um, aligned with that new model of care. And I think that's a really important um, thing to look at making sure there's alignment. Um, choose metrics wisely. So make sure the metrics you choose incentivize the behavior you want to incentivize. Um, and so we talked a little bit about this. As far as the range of percentiles or of percentages um, that you want to include for each of these, that's where there's some variation, but you want to make sure that it's not too narrow. 
um, of a percentage because if not, it's not going to have enough of an impact. Provide the tools. This is a key piece. A compensation model that incentivizes high quality, high patient satisfaction, and low cost may not change physicians' behavior if they do not have the tools to improve these measures. So providing the resources for physicians to meet goals of the value-based system will ensure the compensation model effectively incentivizes the desired behavior. Um, the clinical decision support embedded in electronic health records, for instance, can send physicians alerts to help drive a focus on population health management. Um, so that's one example, but making sure that the tools are supporting the providers in achieving those incentives. Um, and setting time aside, I think, is really important for providers to get trained on, on using the tools and how those affect and making sure to make that connection on how the work they're doing is affecting um, those measures. Um, and again, I will emphasize the whole piece about the team, especially when we're looking at quality, patient satisfaction measures. It's really important to um, include the whole team in that. Um, and modify the model over time so you don't have to stick to one thing. Um, test different things as you go and see what works. Um, healthcare leaders need to recognize that a new compensation model will not be perfect on day one. They need to constantly analyze data and improve the model over time, says Dr. Asplin from Fairview. Um, so, for example, with Fairview, they added a provision to its compensation model that adjusts Fairview physicians' compensation based on how their overall payment and productivity compares with the market median. Um, this provision ties physician compensation to the health system's current revenue stream as the system is still reimbursed based largely on productivity. Um, so that's really very innovative. Um, haven't seen too much of that. Um, Fairview will also modify the model in a October of this year by adding total cost of care as a determinant of 5% of the physician's compensation. And the percentage of payment based on quality will be reduced to 35%. So they're making adjustments as they go, just given uh, changes in, in the environment. Um, so adding that flexibility to whatever model you develop um, is a, a key piece. So these are some of the lessons learned from those two case studies. Um, I think it's always good to see what others are doing and some of the best practices. Um, that is um, the end of my presentation. Wanted to um, open it up to more questions and see if anyone would like to share maybe some of the work that you are doing um, around uh, compensation at your practices. Okay, I have a question here that says, do you have a sense in these if these incentive programs overcome burnout potential? That is a really good question. Um, so JSI does a lot of work around joy and practice. Um, as you know, that's one of, one of the aims. And um, we look at how the compensation models affect that, that burnout factor. Um, some of the things that I've said throughout the presentation are key to help with that. Um, again, one is including the whole team and not just the provider, because we know that um, if it just all relies on one on the provider, then it could um, it could contribute towards burnout. Um, making sure that the measures that you're picking are aligned with the work that you're doing within your practice. So you don't wanna be adding additional work, you wanna make sure that it aligns. Um, and making sure that you're communicating how that aligns and making sure that you are getting feedback, often feedback from providers is really important. Because that um, the key here is to design something that is simple, that aligns with where your, your mission and your vision for your organization and that aligns with, um, with what the team is, is, is doing and making sure that patients are um, included in that equation. Um, so that's where it's really important to look at all those factors and get feedback when you're designing your model. And again, I reiterate this a bunch of times because 
the more simple, the better. I mean, then people understand it, they can see how they can have an impact. And um, if you make it too complex, then it's just going to be overwhelming and contribute towards burnout. Um, let's see, we have another question here on the examples. Uh, basis 10% on quality metrics. Is this an additional 10% bonus if quality met, or is there a set salary in place that assumes 10% of the salary is paid out if quality met? Um, so this is an additional incentive payment that they were giving um, on. Um, so for the bonus that they were giving the providers, um, they had 10% um, an additional 10% um, linked to quality uh, metrics. Uh, let's see, here we have another question. Do you recommend group incentives which include in the full team our NMA behavioral health provider when certain quality goals are met? Yes. Um, I do recommend group incentives. Um, I've seen this um, in practice, actually, that when the whole team is incentivized, um, then the outcomes um, are, are better. And again, it does contribute towards team, teamwork and joint practice. Um, so what that would look like is you're making sure that in everyone's bonus or compensation packages, you're tying part of that to the quality metrics that you've selected or patient satisfaction or whatever um, metrics you're deciding to look at, that everyone's bonuses um, are tied to, to part of that. And so then, um, there is that um, incentive to work together as a group. And you could say, um, and then you can say, if we achieve those quality metrics as a group, then everyone gets paid that bonus. Um, and then also you can have some that are more individual depending on, on what the measure specifically is. But I think when it comes to quality, patient satisfaction, those are, those are, measures that do require teamwork. So I think that that was your question. If there's some additional, please let me know. Um, behavioral health providers are hard to compensate and incentivize in the same way as family medicine and specialists. Um, very true. Any suggestions on how to compensate IBH staff um, when much of their work is relationships and outcomes are hard to measure? Yeah, that is a really good question. And actually, um, after, after this uh, webinar, I can look at um, some literature on that. And maybe, Suzanne, I can send you um, some articles that talk specifically about, um, because this is very new, and so there's not much evidence um, out there. So it's more like case studies. But how do you compensate behavioral health providers to make sure that um, they're contributing towards the, the quality measures? Um, so what I would recommend is having a conversation with your teams, with the behavioral health providers, with the uh, medical providers, with other team members to see like which measures can be impacted by um, the behavioral health providers as well as other team members um, that you could potentially include. Um, and I think it just really depends on what your model looks like. Um, so if you have behavioral health fully integrated into um, your primary care practice, um, then it might have a more direct impact. But if it is um, separate, it might be a little harder. So those are some things to consider. And Suzanne, I'll, I'll send you some case studies on, on that to share with the group. Sounds great, thank you. Um, there's another question here. I think we have a couple more minutes. Um, so where can we get more information such as sample compensation plans? Um, so in these sources that I've included, um, 
I think they're in here, yeah. So in these resources at the end of the slide, there's some information in there that you could look at. Um, and if you do need more, if you want to email um, Suzanne and then she can let me know and I could try finding um, more examples for you. And Suzanne, I don't know if you want to add anything to that question, if you have other ideas. Absolutely. That's something that we're actually going to be um, talking about next time. So, um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and we will have some more information forthcoming. Great. Um, so I have a request here that um, Stephanie would love to hear um, some creative ideas from other health center representatives on what they've done. Um, so I don't know, Suzanne, if there's any effort to maybe compile some information on what different health centers are doing. Sure, we actually, um, that's, um, Stephanie, we hear you, and it's always great to hear from folks that are on the front lines doing these things. And so we actually have a best practices library that you can find on our website at chcworkforce.org, and you can put it in there. And if you have something that is working for you, and we would love to hear about it. So go to our website, enter best practice in the search and it'll come up and you can enter the information there about what you're currently doing and we would be more than happy to include that in next week's presentation as well as um, you know if it's something that we get a lot of then we might do um, a series on best practices in the future so great thank you Suzanne well, I'll hand it over to you. I think we have a minute left and I don't see any other questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to Alexia for being with us today. And we really do appreciate her expertise and her insight on these different compensation models and explaining them and going through the pros and cons. I know we've heard a lot about specific um, compensation plans and incentive programs, but it's really good to hear a bunch of different ideas and different ways that folks can approach this issue. So that about wraps us up for today. We do have one more webinar in this compensation series and that's next week, June 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And so I hope you all will join us for that. And in the meantime, you will receive a recording of this webinar in your inbox and the handouts are available in the handouts section of your go to toolbar and they can also be downloaded on our website. So again, thank you to Alexia and for everyone for being here today and we will talk to you guys soon. Take care everybody. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.